Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is regularly scheduled. It's regularly scheduled, not on a regular night, <laughs> of the uh, special holiday edition. Yeah, of the uh, Sunderland Select Board. It's uh, January 18th. I'd like to call us to order at. Can't look at the computer for a time. At 6:33. 633. 633. Yep. You all set, Jeff? Um, I am. We're. We're just trying to figure out if the finance committee has a quorum. We think that the person on the phone is a finance committee member. Linda, have you dialed in? Is that your phone number? Yes, that's me. Oh, Fantastic. okay. Thank right. you, Linda. There we go. So we have three members present. This is a Sunderland Finance Committee. We have three members present. So we have quorum, and uh, we can call the order at 6:34. Excellent. Okay. We're taking one set of minutes. Uh, yes. Okay. Yep. All right. So uh, we'll go right into the. Uh, we'll we'll uh, put the minutes and stuff off right now. We'll talk. We'll go to new business and we'll talk to uh, since it's six thirty-five. By my official uh, Verizon timepiece, we have Chief Dan Metropolis, Chief. Why don't you fill us in on the uh, police department budget? Well, good evening. Thank you for having me. Uh, so I know I forwarded it all off to, uh, to Sydney, so you all had it. And we have, <clears throat> uh, this year again, we have another increased request for a full-time police officer. Uh, for that we get our full-time staff from five to six. Uh, and in doing that, we also reduced the overtime budget and the part-time budget uh, right off the get-go. And we believe that depending on how we position the schedule that we can look into this for future years, uh, as of right now, the part-time is scheduled for three shifts per week. And this new person, um, if we're granted this position, will then take over uh, at least one of those I'm sorry, two of those, but one of them would be taken off the schedule completely, and the other one would be moved to a different time based upon the graphs that I sent for uh, the call volumes. We have call volumes per day and how busy it is. Um, and, and as well, we want to continue with how well the police department's been working with the residents in the community, and we want to continue with building community relations and going forward with that. So based on the statistical data that I submitted to the boards showing the calls by day of the week and showing how we progressed, to, uh, progressed from 2016 all the way up to 2021. Um, it shows that the, uh, the call volume itself and when they come in, what parts of the day they come in, uh, we can try to position it. I remember I, I came to you a couple years ago with my first graph to show you and, and we saw that Wednesdays were the, the, the lowest days. Um, and uh, that's fluctuated a bit since then, but um, I believe that based on the, the officer's abilities to interact and utilize the computer system that we have more efficiently uh, in the past three years, um, they've, they've had that same system uh, since prior to me coming here, but we, uh, we connected with the regional dispatch center more in a way, so we have uh, a more robust in-house system. We can actually see everybody's information from Franklin County, and when we deal with either uh, commuting traffic, people driving in and out, uh, who reside in, in the area towns. We can see if they've been dealt with, uh, or if there's any other uh, types of calls or complaints coming in in those towns that are similar to the types of calls that we deal with. Um, so that's, that, that shows on the graph. The, uh, the request for the, the full time, like I said, uh, this is my third year now, I think I requested it. And um, we've seen a steady incline in calls for service. And I believe that uh, we're at a point now, especially with uh, ARPA funds coming out or having them come out, uh, that we can potentially utilize that to uh, augment um, the, the burden onto the town instead of going directly through with a full increase of the town. Um, and then the other expense, I'm sorry, the other increase was for the expenses. Um, that is. 1,000 directly related to the fuel budget, the other 2,000 goes up with the rest of the expenses. Costs of doing services, um, you know, maintenance on the cruisers to uh, supply 
uh, different items we have to order and have in our possession uh, for clerical work, admin work, or just everyday police officer duties, uh, those costs have come up. So uh, all in all, the budget shows an increased request of 10.75%, but I'm hoping that the, the initial uh, shock of that could be absorbed by the AFPA funds uh, over the next three years and give us a chance to um, figure out how to deal with uh, the increased budget at the end of this uh, and uh, give us some time to see how uh, having that extra full time on really works within the department and for the town. I can get into more specifics if you want to know uh, line by line as, uh, as how those go up um, or we can pause and talk about the budget. If you could, please, Chief. Line by line? Yeah. Sorry. All right, so the easy one is the, uh, the expense side. On the expense side, like I said, the fuel was going to go up by $1,000. Uh, the other increase we have is to the uh, IMC system agreement. That's the regional CAS system that we have. Uh, the state um, took on some of the burden for the uh, changeover that we did a couple years ago. And as the years progress, we're going to start seeing more of a burden up to us. So that line went up. Um, about $350. Uh, the clothing allowance line went up by $950. Uh, that's based on if a full-timer is uh, authorized. And then the dues and subscriptions, that's just the yearly dues that we have for uh, instructors, certifications, or uh, different associations that we're part of, from mass chiefs to uh, some of the other branches that we, uh, we incorporate ourselves onto. Uh, as far as the payroll side of the house, um, the overtime cost, like I said, was reduced by $2,700 and change. That was a 14.8% decrease. The Part-time budget, that's in two sections. Uh, the one section that wasn't touched is uh, 34,472. That is basically a part-time officer pay for shifts on uh, holidays and any uh, benefit time that the full-timers have as a full-time employee. Uh, so if they take vacation, we fill it with the part-time, but we try not to have it open, so that would still provide a 24-hour coverage. Uh, the other line is uh, initially was a $24,413 line. That was the three shifts per week for part-time. Uh, per contract, the part-timers are getting an increase in pay this year, or I'm sorry, next year, it's on July 1. Um, so instead of reducing the line by a third, um, we had to ac uh, account for their pay raise uh, for the contract. So that line goes down just under 27%, which is a reduction of $6,241. Um, it would have been more, but um, like I said, with the contract, part-timers are now gonna go, in July we'll be getting more money, so we had to accommodate for that. Um, and that is basically, the other increases for full-time are just contract uh, approved, uh, that the town signed off on, so the officers get a 2.5% increase. Um, and uh, two of the officers get a step as well, so that shows a little bit of an increase to them as well. And you've known me long enough, I, I talk really fast and I can keep talking, so anytime you can jump in. Well, uh, you have questions? Um, Chief, Joe, yes. um, do you have any idea, I wrote it in the chat room, but any idea what percent that fund, I think you said ARAP did touch stay fast, but is it ARAP fund? Any idea how percent that might offset? Well, the, the full time request is uh, just under $49,000. Um, that would be 49000 per year. Uh, the full request for the, uh, for the patrolman to include some of the reductions, but the, it shows a 21%, 21.5% increase. But I believe not all of that would, come, would be covered under the ARPA funds. Uh, it would be uh, about forty-nine, just, on, just under forty-nine thousand. 
That's not counting any um, costs that the treasurer would have to bear for uh, any towns increase for uh, health insurance or uh, coverage that way. Um, but if you say about sixty thousand uh, dollars every year for three years is one hundred eighty. So, so chief, um, with the with the schedule, could could you provide us with with a schedule September, what would look like September twenty three, versus September twenty two, meaning people on shift, um, part time, full time, and how 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 it's going to work? You, you know what I mean? No, definitely. I, I can put that together. Obviously, the, the September. 22 schedule has already happened, so that's easy. Yeah. September 23 schedule could be a, uh, a, a template of what it could be. Yeah, right. going forward, I could definitely supply that for you. Yeah. So, so we, so we, we would have an idea of what, what the, what the schedule is now using part time, mm -hmm. and, and again, I, I know there, there, there are advantages to having full time versus part time, and, and I guess that's my next question, with with the way that things have changed with full-time versus part-time, can you, can you discuss those, that as well a little bit about how, we, how it was going to affect our budget? Definitely. So with, a, with the Police Reform, Re, Police Reform Act? Yeah. So as a lot of you may know, uh, a lot of changes have happened for policing uh, in the Commonwealth and across the country. Uh, we're lucky that in this state, Massachusetts has been on the forefront of showing a lot of uh, trainings and certifications for officers. So they've really gone above and beyond compared to a lot of other states across the nation. Um, but there were still some changes that needed to be done. One of those changes uh, was the forming of POST-C, so the Peace Officer Standards and Training uh, Commission. And they're implementing a lot of what minimum requirements are needed for police officers, both part-time and full-time. The biggest thing that we're dealing with as a police department, especially a smaller town like ours, is we're dealing with the fact that we've had the luxury of dealing with or having part-time officers. Uh, I, I can say that myself, from Central Mass, to a lot of, if not all of the officers that are full-time, in fact, all of the officers we have full-time, have started part-time somewhere, whether it be here or somewhere else. They've been able to advance themselves and go into a full-time status, and they've, they've kept up their certifications to the full-time. Part of the recommendations for POST is for the part-timers to go through uh, a training that will put them on basically the same level. Uh, and they broke it up into three groups, and they basically cut the alphabet in a third and said A through H, if your last name starts A through H, you start uh, this year, and you have until June of this, uh, coming up June, to be certified and to be finished with all of that training. Every year, officers deal with their in-service training, their local training, so firearms, coordination, uh, certification, I'm sorry, uh, but other uh, in-service training for uh, what's required by the MPTC, which is the Municipal Police Training Committee. That committee, along with POST, have uh, informed all of the police departments across the Commonwealth about this is how part-timers, not only do they have to do that, but in the first third, A through H, have to attend what they call a bridge academy. That bridge academy then gives them more hours of training and certification, so that way, come the end of June 30th, so come July 1, as long as they've completed. So, so <coughs> when you're talking about attending a Bridge Academy, okay. now are they, are they attending, is the, is the officer attending on his own time, or is he attending on time that is paid for by the town? Well, I can't speak across the state, but here in Sunderland, um, out of the eight part-timers that we currently have, there are five that fall under the A through H. One of that five is a retired full-timer, so he's exempt from going to Bridge because he went to the full-time academy. Yeah. The other four, um, they have to attend 200 hours. Out of that 200 hours, uh, 80, I'm sorry, yes, 80 hours is online. So what I've already done, I've already spoken with the union, I've already spoken with the officers numerous times in the last year, that they need to handle the online training either while they're on duty or at home. There's other requirements. There's three in-person phases. There's a firearms qualification uh, and certification. 
is a defensive tactics, and is an emergency vehicle operations course. Those three are 40 hours each. Those are in person, and those are paid for, because they're going to the training in person, they're being paid as an employee. Um, remember, Senator Comerford was able to earmark about $100,000 towards the uh, Franklin County towns to assist in these small towns in, in paying for these employees to go. So we're able to get about $2,000-ish per officer to help offset some of the costs. Um, what? That's just a small portion of total. That's just a small portion. Because they, if you're paying somebody to go for the full 200 hours, right? and you basically do the math and say dollar amount times 200 hours times how many officers, there's your bill. Um, that's not to mention all the other expenses that come with that. So when the vehicle course, we're paying for fuel, we're paying for any maintenance of the vehicle, tires, things, because they take a beating when they go through these courses. Mm -hmm. They teach them how to handle the situation because when they get back to the town, if they have to respond to a call or maneuver themselves around other things, they want to make sure that they're familiar with and, 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 and comfortable with uh, uh, not aggressive driving, but learning how to drive in the offense, but in, you know, also in the defense. Oh. So, no, Chief, Chief, yeah. one, 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 one thing. Just, I Sorry to interrupt, but I, to, to me, I, I think I think that the additional training is. And, and again, I always thought it was amazing when the full-time officer. We haven't had a, a lot in the last five or six years that we've had to send to, to training. Mm -hmm. But the full-time officer, the training, the defensive driving, the the pursuit driving. I, I and I would hope that the de-escalation of concerns is going to be much more a much more in-depth training of the full-time officer that our part-time officers have never had before but what it in your budget that additional officer is replacing part-time officers so or is, is that is that one of your goals? So my goal is by adding that full-time officer, it would help alleviate some of the call volume by spreading now having a full-time certified officer across the board, but then giving us the flexibility of moving the schedule in a certain way to allow for a whole myriad of different things. Not just the call response, but still incorporating the community policing aspect that we have and, and working with the public and having enough officers to cover a uh, select a few shifts that would still be able to give a uh, response time or give the ability of a civilian calling for a police officer to handle the influx and calls. Um, a part-time officer, not to take away from some of the part-time officers we've had have been on for many, many years, and some of them are new. Uh, they've all gone through their specialized training to be that officer to, to, before they start day one in the streets. But going forward, at the end of the Bridge Academy, so at the end of the three years, we're not going to have a pool to dip into of part-time officers. There's not going to be those part-time candidates who will be running around trying to work for you in a part-time capacity. And a lot of these people that get certified, some of the smaller towns, if, if not almost all the smaller towns, will start seeing a lot of them being um, scooped up. So we're gonna see a lot of changes and we're gonna start seeing officers leaving or <coughs> the pool that we can pull, pull from is no longer there because they're all being picked up by these other agencies and we won't be able to use that. So we'll have to rely on either retired officers taking shifts or those part-time officers who like working in this type of community that already have a full-time job doing something else and they wanna maintain their status as a police officer, a certified police officer in Massachusetts and continue with that. And, and see, that, I guess that's that's the next my next question. And, and it, nothing against. Let's say on the Cape, the Cape, the Cape, their 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 staffs increased by a hundredfold. Okay, so what's to prevent someone that's trained in Sunderland from 
working in Harwich all summer long. Or not Harwich, but Wellfleet, because they're, they're getting $50 an hour, and they get to live on the beach. Yeah. Um, not that you would, no. But, but you, so you, 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 and, 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 and I guess, conversely, or just like you said, someone training up an officer to go, but still works part-time in Charlotte. How, how do you, so wh who, how do you determine who the lead agency is? Because we know that a lot of part-timers will work four or five jobs, and nothing against that. They, they're, they're trying to survive, I understand mm -hmm. that. But we, we had the same thing with, with VEST, okay? And that, because VEST, I mean, typically are for that person. They're fitted to that person. Well, if the person works in Charlemont during the summer, he takes his issued vest from Sunderland to Charlemont. That is a very right? good potential, yes. So, so how do you, but so now Sunderland residents, how, how, how do we know or who pays for your officers their part time if they're working in multiple, multiple towns? Or is there, is there a requirement? Is there a requirement that says, okay, we're going to pay you, we're going to pay for this upgrade, but we're going to say that you owe us five years? Of work, okay, and that's something that the town would have to decide if they wanted to do, go that route. But I know right now one of my officers works full time at a college, yeah. So he's going through the Bridge Academy for both the college and with us, and because he works full time for them, they they have the burden or they've chosen to take the burden of putting him through that Bridge Academy. Mm -hmm. So we get a pass on him. We don't have to worry about putting him through. But when he comes to Sunderland, he's still certified to a diploma. <coughs> He's just being paid to go to these trainings by a bigger agency. Uh, another one of my officers works in another town smaller than ours, and we can either share the burden between the two towns to go through the Bridge Academy, or <laughs> yeah, <so> we're basically <laughs> because we all know we, we all know that geez, if we're going to share expenses, that, that that doesn't happen. Well, no, but if, if say this person has to do 120 hours. Yes. And 60 of it be covered by that town and 60 of it be covered by us. Yeah. yeah so that, that's the type of idea of sharing it. There's also, uh, in this specific officer, uh, I spoke to that chief that they've elected to send them to the Bridge Academy as well. So they're still attending the Bridge Academy as a Sunderland officer and as that town mm. officer, but they're being paid to go by that town. So we're still getting a certified officer and we're reaping the benefits in that case, uh, in, in those two cases. Um, so, you know, when you talk about the Cape, there's a lot of times where people get hired part-time to work down there, hundreds and hundreds of officers, and, and a lot of officers may start off that way. They start mm -hmm. off in a lower paid job where it's, okay, 8, 10, 12 hours a day for three, four, five days a week, and then at the end of the summer, now they're trying to scramble to get a position somewhere because now they don't need them. Um, a lot of times though, I'm sorry, not a lot of times, looking forward to see how uh, policing is changing. If you can't, if say that town, let's say Falmouth, has to send a ton of people to that training, they may not elect to send a ton of people to that training because they don't have the budget for that. They only have the budget for the summer help. They don't have the budget for the year round cost. We don't have that per se because we're just dealing with the eight part-timers that we've had and we're using them and utilizing them to cover us to help augment the full-time staff. At some point though, one or a couple of those officers may decide to go somewhere else full time. And if that happens, the pool that we used to have to be able to dip into to pull up a potential candidate won't be there. There hasn't been a part-time academy one in a while because they've been going through the system. Mm. There is one going on in Worcester, I believe it's gonna take about a year to get through an academy, but that's <coughs> a part-time basis. It's the first of its kind. We have to see how does that work? Is it something that's doable? And then we would continue with that. And if we do continue with that, when I say we, I mean the state, is the state looking at that as saying, this is a certified academy that they're going through. And when they leave, they can work as a certified officer in the Commonwealth. Because once you get that certification, you know, if you were to leave your town to go to another town, say you, you worked in Sunderland, but then you decided to go work in Peabody, Peabody may not know if you had any problems here, but under the post commission, when you go and get hired in that city or town,
they will see all your certifications and see if you had any issues. And they may not, even though Peabody may want to hire you, Post may say they can't be a police officer right. because of whatever happened in, say, this town. So, so is there any requirements that, that the departments become accredited now? There's no requirements for accreditation. There are standards that POST will have. So a department will have to be certified to POST. But for years, the Massachusetts Accreditation Commission had two levels. They had accreditation, they had certification. Right. They're vastly different. POST has a couple of dozen certifications that you have to get to to make sure that your department's certified, whereas the Mass Accreditation Team has hundreds. You know, right. to be a certified department through them, I want to say it's about 100. Fifty-two uh, tiers that you have to go through. Maybe a little, um, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's around there. Whereas post is only like I think about thirty-two or thirty-six or something like that. Um, so we could look into the idea of our our department becoming certified and/or accredited through the state, the Massachusetts Accreditation Commission. But there are also costs and fees associated with that, right? Because even though they're part of the state, they're not funded by the state. If they were funded by the state, then it would, wouldn't cost us a dime and we could be a member of it and, and make every attempt to become an accredited department. Um, when dealing with all the certifications from post and all the new updates for policies and, and trying to stay on top of all that, it takes hours, of, hours per week of not just the chief's time but also every single officer within that department because they have to be aware and follow and understand all of the, the things that have been put in place from the Massachusetts Accreditation Commission <coughs> or, uh, and or through post. So there's, there's that issue as well. Uh, in a small town, we've enjoyed having the ability that our officers can you know, handle uh, calls from soup to nuts. We don't have divisions where you know, we have a motor vehicle division that will handle just motor vehicle complaints. It's the officer on duty that handles it. So when someone calls in a speeding complaint, it goes to the officer that's on duty, and they respond and then notify everyone else. A bigger agency would have uh, a motor vehicle division, you would have an investigative division, you'd have all of these different sections that would be able to put their expertise to those certain levels instead of everyday patrol, business checks, uh, dealing with the citizens, dealing with any complaints, uh, and then once you have somebody that you've either charged or arrested, then following through, following through with the prosecution of that. You know, um, when, when an officer puts a handcuff on somebody, it's from that point all the way until whether that person's found innocent or guilty. Uh, whereas in some of the bigger agencies, you pass it off to a detective bureau, or you pass it off to a prosecution bureau, or whatever. So there's a lot of things that need to be inputted. If we're gonna see policing change, and uh, we've already seen it change. I mean, the 25 years I've been on, but it's going to continuously change uh, in the next three to five years and beyond. But in the next three to five years, we'll see a massive change. So, Chief, looking just going on, on your overall budget, mm -hmm. so it it looks, and, and again, they're just using rounding up math or rounding mm -hmm. down or whatever. Ten, you're saying like 90% of your budget is labor? Yes, because my expense line, uh, as of right now, the fuel line is 14500 and then the remainder of that line is, I think, about 35000 in yes. expenses. The rest of the budget, and the total budget, is 529000 So if I remove that, just under yeah, like, 160000 Yeah, it looked about 9.5%. Yeah, so a, around. From the, the part time clerk, yeah. part time, full time clerk, to all the police officers, full time and part time. So you, you don't have any of the building operation in your, that's all in the fire budget? Yeah. Or no, no the building the building is building our, has right, its own. Right. Yeah. yeah. The building has its own. Yeah, so we, we take the build, we have the building. Yeah. Okay. I liked it better when it was all in the fire department. Yeah. <laughs> they put it in their budget. <laughs> yeah. Bob, Bobby used to love that. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Jeffrey? Ask a question? So, Chief, I think w what I'm hearing about the full-time officer is sort of two things, and I'm one, hoping you can confirm. One is it would help with scheduling. Well, maybe there are three things. Um, help be more flexible with the scheduling and, and shifts. Um, the second is it would reduce the cost of uh, part-time and overtime shifts. And then the third is it would make, it, it, it's a hedge against the anticipated lack of part-time officer availability over the next three to five years. Is that, is that sort of? All, all exactly, okay. yes. Okay. I like to speak and, and talk a lot, so nice and quick. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, it, it's helpful to get the full yeah. context, um, but I, you know, I, I just think um, wanted to make sure that I was I was getting that correctly. Uh, finance committee questions from finance committee. Joe, you're on mute. Someday we'll have a meeting over here. Yeah, so sorry about that. So. So then a fourth point, the full-time officer, from what you say, would have more train, will, will have completed more training than a part-timer as well. Is that correct, Chief? As of last year's standards, yes. Uh, going forward, the part-timers are attending the Bridge Academies, so we right. could potentially use one of our own part-timers and bump them up to a full-time status, or uh, we could go outside and try to hire from outside. Now, out of the eight part-timers you have, how many are over 50, 55, and potentially not being around, willing to work in the future? I don't think any of my part-timers are over 55. Okay, so I have, you're- I have one that's over 50, but- So your anticipation of part-timers leaving is really to different areas, not, not really for stepping aside. Yeah, so a lot of towns have gone through and, and, and spoken to their part-time officers and said, listen, these are the minimum requirements you have to do to be a part-time officer. And across the Commonwealth, some people have gone through and said, you know what, I'm just going to do my time until June, and then I'm done. Um, we're very fortunate we haven't had anyone do that. Uh, we're very fortunate with the, the part-time staff that we have. They truly do love working here, and they make my job and my sergeant job so much easier with scheduling. And I, when I started part-time, I wanted to be as available as possible. Uh, and I see that in a lot of the part-timers that we have, and I'm thankful for that. Um, but yes, at some point after, so year one officers will be done this June 30th, and then year two officers, we don't have anyone in, so we get a second year of a break, and then we have year three officers. Um, now, whether or not we're able to maybe bump up the year three people to year two, so we can try to get it done with, that would be great. Um, but. Uh, I don't see them leaving because they're just sick of it. I think that if anyone does leave, it might be because they get a full-time job somewhere. Because once they're done with this training, they have the potential of working somewhere as a full-time officer. They're a full-time certified officer. It just depends on the town and the department of whether or not they're gonna require them to then, after all of this, still attend a full-time academy uh, at the, uh, the state level. Um, so it all depends. But I think that the officers that work for us uh, truly do enjoy this town and, and, and love this town and, and want to continue working here. So if you hire full-time, though, you would have to let two of them go? Or do they still just have shorter part-time shifts? They would have less shifts to, to take from. Um, okay. I don't want to get rid of them because if I end up losing one or two, I don't want to go from eight to four. Right. Thank you, Chief. Yeah. And that's always been a little bit of a risk with us is migration to a, you know, a, whether it be a bigger community or like you know, yes. Northampton or something or whatever. Yeah. 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 I, I've already seen it. A neighboring town lost one of their full time officers to Greenfield. Not to speak ill of them, but, you know, uh, walked in the door making more money. And yep. yeah. H historically, when we lose part time officers, they're going for full time jobs. Right. Because they start I, I mean, that's, yeah. and, and, but you're, the, M many, not all, man many part-time officers will put themselves through the academy, part-time academy, because they want to get their foot in the door. Yeah. 
not too many not too many towns send part time officers to the academies. Maybe some do, but not not too many. The two towns I've worked on, we have not ever yeah. paid. We, for we usually our our part time was already. have always been part-time academy trained. Usually we lose officers because they, they, they go to Amherst, Greenfield, Northampton, uh, a bigger community, not in, and they get a full-time job. And that's what, and that's, that's, that's their goal. Cause that's why they work three or four jobs is to get that full-time job. So, but, See. but that's a good point about, it's a good point about, if you lose two officers, what do you do then? Uh, you know, part-time officer. If you lose, two, it's easy if you lose a full-time officer because you can go out and hire a full. Right, you like can another full -time. hire that person. Yeah. But what do you do if you try to replace part-time officers with if, with this requirement now that they be trained? So right now, um, we would have to have. We already kind of already have this in a, in a way. We have officers that some people call Velcro patch cops. They take the patch off from one town and put the patch on from the next town. Well, you know, they, I'm speaking in middles, but that's basically what happens. They, they work for a part-time in this town, work part-time in another town. Um, we're gonna get to a point where we may have to seriously look at doing that and utilizing people who are working part-time in other towns. I don't see, although it, it's possible, I don't see, say you were full-time in the town next door, that you would work part-time for us. Because if they're working part-time for us and something bad happens, they get injured, they get hurt, something something happens where it's a large investigation, it takes away from their full-time job. And policing is not its traditional nine to five uh, work day. It's 24 hours a day. So the chances of them having to work a midnight shift or a weekend shift, a holiday shift, or come across a large investigation, you don't want, or I'm sorry, People that work full time in a law enforcement agency may not want to work part time in another one because all your benefits are over here and all your obligations are over here. And yes, you have obligations for this town. So I don't see us trying to utilize current full time officers of other towns to work here part time. Retire full time, definitely. The only thing that they're bound by at that point is uh, how many hours they can work under the state retirement system. Right. Okay. Any more questions about the budget? Crystal, David, no, no, Jeff, at the moment. finance, all set. Okay, you want so to talk actually about? I your do have one question: Is if you lose some of these part-time officers, does that change your projections here for your overtime shifts and stuff? I don't think it changes our projections for this year. I think that um, if we start losing part-time officers, we're going to start seeing the loss after year two or after year three. And that's when we're gonna have to really figure out how we're gonna fill the schedule. We wanna still provide that 24 hour, seven day a week coverage that the town has been able to enjoy for decades. Um, you were able to add another full-time officer to the ranks around 2001. So it's been about 20 years since we've done that. Um, yes, you've hired and, 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 and people have come and gone, um, but the basic number of full-time officers has stayed the same for the past 20 years. I think that the part-time staff that we currently have, we're gonna have a great fit with them and we're really gonna enjoy being able to use them. But I think that, and yes, potentially three years or more, we may start seeing one or two or, or the, the entire makeup of the part-time staff change. Um, but as it stands right now and going forward for the following year, I don't think even if we lost two of them, it would change the overtime. Okay. Okay. Chief, you want to talk about capital? Capital, yes. So, how much money you got? Uh, no. So, the capital expenses that we submitted, um, basically three of them. The first one was the same one I, I bought last year, it's a cruiser replacement. Uh, I'm looking for the town to um, 
fund a replacement to the 2012 Chevy Tahoe Cruiser that we have. With? Uh, with one of the new uh, hybrid SUVs. Ford put out those hybrids a couple years ago, and some of the guys in the state police have them. I think Deerfield has two of them. There's other towns that do have them. Um, we're not looking at replacing it with a Mustang. We're not looking at replacing it with the Charger. Another um, Explorer? Uh, the Explorers? The Hellcat? Yeah, they basically look like the Explorers. Yeah, the Hellcats. Yeah. They yeah. look like the Explorers. <laughs> they're, they're called PIUs, but they were okay. police intercept utilities. They basically look like the Ford Explorer. We have two Ford Explorers now. Those two Fords are 2017s. One we bought new, and the other one we bought, we bought it new, but it was two years old. Yeah. Uh, it had less than 100 miles, so we're, we were lucky in that respect. They don't have any old cruisers just sitting on the lot or any cruisers that haven't been sold sitting on the lot. Um, everyone's, you know, scooped them all up. So really the only decisions that we can make are, are we gonna go with another Durango, are we gonna go with the Chevy Tahoe, a pickup truck, or the hybrid. Um, I am siding towards the hybrid SUV um, because the Tahoe is 10 years old. It's got a, as of today, it has 100, 47,975 miles. Um, we have put a lot of uh, sweat equity and money into that thing for the past year, especially um, with everything that's been going on uh, with it. Um, even though it only has 148,000, it still has countless hours of running. So the, the vehicle is being run uh, all the time. Um, everyone usually sees it on the evening shift. That's the vehicle that's run on the second shift. So after uh, four o'clock at night, that's the car you see driving around usually. Um, so with that, the, 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 the Tahoe's running um, pretty rugged. It, it's probably getting much less than 16 miles per gallon. Um, and <laughs> much less. <laughs> on a good day, probably. <laughs> on a good day. Uh, and the hybrids uh, have been known to uh, give us a much greater uh, return on, um, on, on gas mileage. Um, I've run anywhere between 24 to 34 miles a gallon, so that's a great uh, increase compared to what we've had. Uh, the Durango that we purchased two years ago, um, that is uh, now at 17,900 miles, and that truck usually runs between 16 to 19 miles per gallon. Uh, it, does, it does a screwy thing that when you're sitting doing radar or you're sitting on the side of the road dealing with an accident or a pole or tree down, uh, you see the gas mileage drop because it's idling, but on average, that one runs at about 16 to 18 miles per gallon. Um, and that's basically better than any of the cars that we have. Uh, the newer the car, the better the gas mileage is gonna be on it, unless you have a V8, which we don't. Um, so the, the, the Chevy Tahoe, we're looking at replacing it with the, the new hybrid vehicles. I'm hoping that, uh, I know last year we had uh, a lot of capital expenses, one of which was the $75,000 to upgrade the radio system that we have. Um, so we weren't unable to, I'm sorry, we were unable to uh, purchase the cruiser then. Um, this year I'm hoping that we have either money in the capital side or potentially could look at using or funding this through the uh, ARPA funds as well. So, so Chief, what, what's, the, what's the cost of a one of the things always is the maintenance on the police cruisers. What what are the options on a on, on a electric cruiser? All electric, not yeah. just a hybrid. Yeah. Uh, the only one that I've seen, and I, I it's been a couple of years since I've looked into it because that's when yeah. uh, Sherry and I were looking into it. Uh, was the Volt? Uh, the Volt is that smaller sedan. I, I thought I thought they I thought the I thought Ford was coming out with the uh, they have an interceptor now truck pickup okay. all electric they're coming out with the Lightning man but they're already like sold out for the next year already yeah. so I mean I, I did look into
the all electrics, I only looked into the, the hybrid because that was a. Uh, the and the only thing, uh, the, only, and the only reason I suggest that is because I'm just, I, I just look at the, you don't have a transmission. You don't have, you know, so you don't have oil, you really only have brake stuff. Yeah. You know, Tires. right, because your, your running costs are dramatically lower. The only, I was thinking the same thing. The only thing I'm, the only thing I'm wondering about is. It's, at least right now, you know, well, the range isn't so much an issue, you know. Um, but like the cold running and things like that, like in the cold, you know, you're going to get less out of your battery and stuff. But it's the, I, it's something to think about, you know. Well, I was talking about an eight hour shift, Dave. Yeah. Right? Uh, ten hour shift. And then, then and, I mean, and if we then, can look then, at it, it makes sense. And, and again, if, if we're going to use. If we decide to use ARPA money or something like that, I would try to. What about a, a green community thing too? Could we tie that into that? So, <clears throat> I was going to mention that I think th there are certainly incentives for um, hybrid and electrical vehicles through green communities, and I th I believe we're still. I forget exactly what a special designated community where we actually get double yeah. the incentive. Um, so I, I, we would certainly include that in our green communities application in the spring. Um, assuming at that point we, we felt like we were moving forward with, with the capital <coughs> request for a cruiser. Um, we would need probably before we apply to determine if it's all electric or, or hybrid is the benefit varies um but yeah i mean i, I think we definitely worth certainly. thinking about you know uh, and again chief I'm, I'm just saying you know i i just look at i i, I mean you're always gonna have to redo you're always gonna have maintenance on brakes you're always gonna have right, brakes but tires. you look at all the you look at how many times have we brought transmissions and rebuild right. tr you know the transmissions and but you take that aside and all of a sudden you just put radios Radios hopefully will be in and out, you know, with repeaters. So, okay. so it, we really look at you again. You don't have the transmission. You don't have the internal combustion engine. You have right. brushless a brushless electric motors that you got great torque. Um, well, that's it. You're gonna you're gonna be really good in the acceleration department. To be you know at least until you know until more people start getting electrics. But yeah, yeah. I mean, it, I know, that's something. One of the things I've been thinking about for a while. I just you know, you have to think about like how is it going to be managed. You know what so, I mean. So I guess, could you look at that, Chief? Oh, most definitely. I, I'm already looking into the hybrid uh, avenue anyway, so I can always reach out and talk to the uh, the vendors that supply the cruisers to see what they have for an all electric version. Um, I don't know who. Like the, it could be like that, right? Like the Lightning, which is the F one fifty electric pickup. I don't know if Rivian is doing anything with. Mm -hmm. um, with police versions, but they, their pickup truck has been pretty big too. Okay. Um, there's a couple other companies I'm trying well, to. Well, and ahead. again, if we could, if 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 I try to keep I an mean, eye out for that, but. I wouldn't say to buy electric just to, because to buy electric. But if you're talking about similar prices and maybe right. save money on on maintenance, and or we could use some of the grants that are available to us with exactly. the green community. Yeah, and then the, the extra cost of the uh, probably two charges, one for the back of the building and one for in the building. Right. Um, in the building for the garage, when the car's in there, they can plug in while they're inside. And then when it's parked out back, it would have to be, I'm assuming, plugged in for at least a night before you can use it. Yeah, because depending on what level charger, you know, you, you could look from... If it's a high capacity charger, it can charge pretty fast. Mm -hmm. But T Tesla makes a Tesla makes a police cruiser. Yeah, that, is it the Model S that they use, or is it a? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's well, Model got S or quite Android. a price tag. On it. Huh? Yeah, they're 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 a little price, but like um, yeah, it could um, be like the X or the Y, like this. Mo Dave, there's a Model Three. Does that make sense three? to you? Yep. Okay. I'll take uh, that's too small. Uh, it's a nice car. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll definitely do that. Oh, yeah. And, and again, I, I'm... 
I mean, because eventually everything will be going electric. Anyway. It's just right. like the, the battery, you know, and just trying to... I guess it would be good to have one to start off with to see how you can use it, you know what I mean? Because you can swap it around for different shifts and stuff, mm -hmm. you know. Definitely something worth... And if not, we at least start with a hybrid. Jeff, we need to get a door. Uh, yeah. Chief on that one. Yep. All right. Yeah, that'll be good. All right. No, definitely. Um, the, the next one was a capital expense for an AED and defib replacements. We don't, why don't we have them already? We do, but they're archaic and they don't make parts for them anymore. So you don't have to crank it up, or do you? You have to actually crank it, <laughs> but the batteries uh, and anything. See, that that with the extra car batteries, batteries for? Yeah. It yeah. probably last longer if you crank so, it. Uh, yeah, it probably is a crank. <laughs> so I, I sent uh, Jeff the, the quotes that we got from the, uh, the company for uh, replacing all of them. Uh, they, they work in, in connection with the South County Ambulance uh, uh, defib machine that they have, the 12 lead. Yeah. Um, so we're looking at uh, replacing all of the fire ones and all of the police ones. Um, that cost is just under $16,000. Um, we did get notification that the state was... 16000 for all of them all or of them. Just, just for the police? No, for police and fire. Total? Yeah, so it's police and fire, it would replace all of them. It would come with the initial uh, adult pad, an initial uh, PD pad, so people on a certain uh, yep. age, and then the batteries. How many units? Yeah. It was just, I didn't see it. Uh, seven. seven. Seven, okay. Yep. Three, for, three for police, four for fire. We also found out that the state was okay, giving four. grant funding. Uh, was it 2,000 or 2,500? I think it was 2,500. So they were going to give 2,500 dollars to each town, not I mean, just not you know one to him and one to me, but right, 2,500 dollars to each yeah. town to help purchasing but to, to buy one. Uh, so this number would be 2,500 dollars less. Can, can I can I recommend that you spend a dollar more and put a uh, disposable razor in each one of those kits if they don't have it? I've already bought a bag of razors. Thank they you. They all have them. So trust me, when the officers do checks on them, if, if we end up using one or the razor breaks because it fell out of the thing, we replace it. Yeah. I, it it's a, a dollar for those big 10 or 12 of them? Yep. Oh, yeah. So, somehow I ended up in a... Uh, uh, healthcare provider CPR class I learned way yeah. more than I ever Did wanted yeah. oh my god and, and and they said the first thing you want to do is go look in your AED kit and if it doesn't have a razor put one in there because yeah. and it's like I would never have thought about that but yeah. there's a whole new appreciation for that line of work huh? oh my god well <laughs> it, it's everything is just it does you know? yeah. Yeah. well and we have we're lucky we have two Three people that, that have a, a medical background. Uh, one of them works for Sun County, another oh, one works for Bay State, oh, yeah. another one is an AMT. One of them is a director that I'm missing his meeting with right now, and he's probably mad at me. But. Yeah. Uh, so they, they, they're on me to make sure that those things are in working order. Yeah. yeah. So are the defibrillator pads on those replaceable? So once you use them, you have to replace them, yes. Yeah, and yeah. you've budgeted for whatever. That's for the initial cost right. to outfit them all with one adult and one PD. It's up to each department to pay for the pads that are used. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you just hope they never get have to open up the case. Yes. First and then if I they put those stickers on you, you better have somebody else. You don't want to be the person taking the stickers off. No, those aren't. Hard. That hurts. Especially when you get a big burn mark under them. I yeah. know it. That's why you shave. That way it sticks right to the skin. All right, so we've got AEDs, a cruiser. Yeah, AED, AED sound like an easy one. That cruiser, that's working. All right, what else you got? The last one, uh, I initially submitted it uh, back in uh, December. It was a... Uh, $74,500 for vehicle repeaters. The fire chief came to me and said that, you know, uh, we tried for the IT grant. We were uns I was unsuccess unsuccessful for getting it. Um, and then the town budgeted $75,000 for the radios. Uh, and in that purchase, we were able to get one for fire, one for police. The repeaters. One repeater that yep. was inside one of the vehicles. Um, this capital request 
uh, I reduced it down by one. So it's now at 62,000 and not 74 by. Uh, the reason being is after going through, the fire chief and I went through a lot of uh, uh, what equipment we needed, and because we were part of the bulk order through FERCOG, mm -hmm. we did get just under $4,000 back from FERCOG for the installation uh, that I did not account for initially in the 75,000. And the order, when the orders were placed, um, I noticed that the quotes that I got before were higher than the invoices that I got later. So that freed up uh, the cost of potentially buying one more repeater through monies that you've already approved from last year. Uh, so that, that one of those repeaters would be purchased. Um, so instead of uh, supplying them for fire and police, I took one of them out of the police request because one of them is going to be paid for by the uh, current radio line that we have. So that request went from 74 and a half down to 62. And that's five repeaters, right? Yes. Okay. I can do the, the math real quick. But so so the, repeat, the repeaters are going to be in each vehicle then, right? So, well, right now I have one. They're mounted in each vehicle. I have one mounted in one of my cars, and he has one mounted in one of his fire trucks. Right. Um, but again, you don't always use that same vehicle. No, but I, but they're so mounted. They're yes. not. So they're mounted in in they they're transferable. When you buy a new cruiser, you're yes. not buying a new repeater. Correct. Yeah. Once you, as long as you stay on the system, which we just went on the system, so why wouldn't we be on the system for at least the next twenty years? Um, once you put this repeater into that, say in my case, my midnight car, my midnight car has it. So when that Chief, they won't be used. They won't be using the same repeater in twenty years. But they'll probably go back to tubes, yeah. you know. But <laughs> but, happening, but who, who the heck knows? Who knows? But <laughs> we'll all be on satellite phones. Yeah. Yeah, Chief, remember, I mean, this was an $8,000, when I first started, it was like an $8,000 that you carried around in a 20-pound bag, so. Yeah, yeah. so the, the, the hope is that this capital request would cover uh, one less repeater for the police because, like I said, there's money left over in the radio line now that I can purchase one and put that into the day shift car. So the other, the other I have one in the Ford uh, SUV, I'm going to put one in the other Ford SUV, so we have at least two shifts covered by that car. So how, how, limited are, how limited are you without the repeaters? So like I, I said before the meeting started, we have about 96 or 98% coverage on our portables. Yeah. It's so outside, almost works wonderful. I'm in here talking to Jeff. I can hear everything. It's when I get into some of the back apartments or the basement apartments or any apartment at 116 flats. Um, with the concrete and the buildup, it just blocks the radio signal and you can't transmit out. Same thing goes with fire. If we have a vehicle repeater, they have that repeater switch on. When fire gets there, they can swap over to that channel and then they can talk to dispatch on their portable just as if they were sitting in the truck. So, so if, you're, if you're on a search and rescue on Toby, is a repeater needed? In most cases, no. I think most of Toby's pretty good coverage. Probably 80% of the mountain is good coverage. We've yeah. identified places where there's no radio coverage. So like the, the back portables. side? Yeah, the back side. The back side really depends on where the where they've got the antennae pointed yeah. currently. But yeah. it's, there's some surprising areas that have holes in them. One of them is the uh, top of Reservoir Road where we fill yeah. water tankers for brush fires. Huh. Zero. Nothing. Huh. Um, with the portables. So there are there are several spots, you know, case in point, I, last few days I was in one of the basement apartments at Cliffside, couldn't hear anything. We may as well have left the radio in the truck. Right. And and we kind of thought that may happen. Yes. Right? Yeah, when we tested the radios that when we were first talking, we yeah. we thought that may have happened. Yeah. Have we done anything with the apartment owners, like if you're over a certain size maybe, to look at having them fund a repeater? It's easier when they're building it. Yeah, uh, I think we, I would we imagine. Would have to do that with 116 flats. Um, they're working on changing it because their initial repeater system that they put in was for the old system. Yeah. So uh, okay. building it for an existing so building, that's going to be more problematic. Yeah. Okay. Is that it, Chief? 
Those are my capital expenses, yes. Okay. Any, any questions? If uh, somebody's on, on Zoom and you want a question, you can hit the little hand thing and just so when I look up, I can see that, okay? Anybody have a question on Zoom? All right. Yeah, if you could, Chief, it looks like Tesla selling uh, cruisers, so. Is it under the requested amount? Uh huh? Is it under the requested amount? <laughs> That I, 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 well, I, well, and, and, and uh, it may be seventy thousand, but if Jeff, Jeff can Jeff can uh, work his magic, it may become underneath that requested amount even. So Jeff is pretty frugal, you know. He is. He's, he's very good. <laughs> he reminds me all the time. How it's like it's like the town's money is his money. <laughs> I respect That's that. always good. Don't look at my bank account. <laughs> <laughs> Don't look at either. <laughs> Remember, and a town doesn't want your town. End of the year, we want to be zero. Yeah. Zero. That's how they do it. Yeah. Cash money. Cash money. No, I'll, I'll, I'm already, like I said, looking into the hybrid versions. I'll look into the uh, all electrics to see. Uh, I know at one point with the green energy, there was a DEP kickback of like seven or eight thousand to outfit uh, a charging station. I don't know if that's still there, but we'll look into all of those options. Yep. Okay. Right. And, and again, I, it it may not be. The hybrid may be the choice, you know, and but give, give us a couple options, okay? Oh, definitely. Okay. Thank definitely. you, Chief. Yep. Thank you. Thanks for Thanks. Sorry to take a little time. Cool. You said if I went over, you'd get everything. So. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the price of it, Dave. You're, you're buying him some uh, defibrillators. So. Yeah. <laughs> the town's buying it. I just put in the request. That's what it is, 50 from me. Thanks, Jeff. That seems All right, Stevie. He he. Uh, That's Chief uh, Is it long range? Soften this up. Huh. Give, give us. <laughs> now you got the, you got the easy you got the easy budget coming up. Yeah. <laughs> it just seems like phenomenal. All right. What do you like to do, Steve? Well, um, I'll go down through. Uh, there's I wonder about for a while. Three, yeah. mostly cosmetic, but like with any other cosmetic thing, if you let it go long enough, it can become more than cosmetic. So we've, we've looked at paint, we've looked at some maintenance outside in terms of the facade, um, where the aprons join the, the building, yep. and a few other things. Um, a lot of that, you know, three years ago was when we put that together, and having the, uh, the folks from the Sheriff's Department come in to do some painting, that's been off the table. But what I, what I did, was in this two thousand dollars i didn't itemize it but just looking at trends and looking at some of the expenses i'd like to see it this year especially since it's been relatively warm up till now knock on wood um, if with some additional monies next year if we uh if we keep the same trend we can tackle some of those projects and mainly buy materials because we've got enough expertise within the fire department to do some of that work, and it's not involved work. It might be um, an afternoon, a day, a few days, minus the painting. That's pretty involved. But some of the um, some of the masonry work, some of the, the sealant work, is pretty benign. Maybe four or five hundred dollars in materials, and we can have some people take care of that. Yeah, because I I don't think we I don't think in and again. You, you're you're so right. You don't want to. You don't. I don't know how often you have them strip and wax the floors. Well, that's ideally every year. That and I don't know. And I don't know if you've been doing that of late. Okay. Been able to. So so, but but I would think that that's that's kind of an important thing because as you said, those, those are the little things that 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 make a difference. Or in in when we started actually when. The school was here a couple of weeks ago talking about a fascia board, mm -hmm. and it's like, well, holy guys, let's replace that fascia before. If you have one piece bad, let's replace that one piece now instead of allowing it to fester and cause a bigger problem. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to be a little more proactive in that respect. Yeah. So, so if if there there are things like that paint, let, let's let's start talking about that, okay? Yeah, there's certainly some things in here. You know, I, I mentioned in my uh, in my request another two thousand dollars would help us pay for some floor cleaning. The last quote we got from 
for floor stripping and waxing, I want to say, was close to a thousand bucks. Yeah. And in you know, years past, I've done cap uh, reserve transfer requests to pay for heating oil out of that account. So it just hasn't been there. And some of that um, expense has been in part to the way the HVAC system operates. Uh, we think we've got that kind of under control for the time being. It's not a long-term fix. But uh, if the first couple of months of the winter have been any indication, I think this year, by the time we get to the spring, there may be um, maybe a little bit of money left over in the account. Certainly this we're talking about for next year. So if we can hold that same angle on those costs, next year we can do a little bit more. We can buy some uh, we can buy some sealant, some good construction grade sealant, and um, maybe even do some painting on the, um, uh, the bay floor, some of the steel elements around the bay doors that are mm -hmm. starting to corrode. Um, at ground level, um, somebody's got a portable sandblaster, sandblast them, get some nice rust inhibiting paint and primer, take care of those. You know, as far as the as far as the ongoing maintenance and so forth, really, you know, a few thousand dollars is probably going to be sufficient to, to keep us um, on par with what needs to be done. Yeah. Um, okay. And there's there's some other costs too on the capital side that I've got. <coughs> but I hear you loud and clear, and we're we're looking at that. It's amazing when we go through a drill night or we have an all day training at the department. A lot of times people will bring up ideas, oh, we should look at this, we should do that. And some of the smaller things, they just get done. We've got a great group of firefighters and I'll come in some evening and look around and I'll say, wow, they just took care of that. So a lot of, a lot of work gets done very quietly and uh, I'm proud to say without an awful lot of requests being made. Absolutely. Okay. Um, on the uh, fire department expense side, that increase is purely to uh, uh, to keep in pace with inflation. We've seen that the cost for a set of turnout gear has gone up four or five hundred dollars, and just about everything else that we, we buy that's a consumable has gone up in cost as well. And generally, throughout the year, uh, we don't end up with much money, if anything, left over at the end of the year. So, just looking at it through that lens. I'm anticipating that uh, this year we're, we're it's going to be tight for us to get everything we need and stay ahead of all of our our obligations like some of the med bags, the equipment for those, the consumables and the perishable things for the trucks, and the uh, the gear. We're in a uh, a very good cycle now of replacing one or two pairs of turnout gear per year along with helmets and boots and so forth, so we don't have to hope and pray for a grant and spend $150,000 on the whole <coughs> every 10 years when it's, you know, if they all come up for expiration at once. Oh, yeah, stagger it. And we're, we're in a great spot. We've got air packs that are new. Um, so we're, we're, we're okay there for a while, and uh, we need a few more radios, but we can hold back with what we have now. With any luck, those can come out of the um, the operating expenses. Why Chief is still here? Did Jeff talk to you about body cams, cameras? We did speak about it. Yes. Okay. Yep. And and you have your your infrared cameras. We've got those. <coughs> They're on the old side. We're probably going to be replacing those in a couple of years. We've got a grant for gas meters, yeah. hmm. which we're very happy to get, and um, that's going to take care of that that ask. But those cameras are one of those things that they they advance so much year over year. Yeah. You look at new ones and you wonder how am I functioning with with this? But you <laughs> learn to work with it, and it's better than nothing. Uh, um, so how how many gases you test for? You got a four or five gas. Four gas meter. And I mean, and they're expensive. Those meters are expensive. Well, they're expensive. The problem is they're also very finicky. They have to be calibrated, and they are 
Can, can I talk to you about calibration? And not to bore people, but, <laughs> but and again, they're, they're, they're a critical part of life safety, but we, we use them, and the ones that we have, we did away with the calibrating gas and all that kind of stuff. So I'll, if you get a second, give me a call, and I'll tell you what we're using now. No. It's because it saved us a bunch of headaches. A bunch of headaches, a bunch of money. Absolutely. But the funny thing with gas meters is when you, I, I canvassed a bunch of folks when we went for the grant to see what we should base the grant on. Yeah. And uh, Chief Davin from uh, Northampton is uh, very active in the, the state hazmat department. Talk to him, talk to other people. And they all say, we use this and it's horrible. We use this and it's horrible. Nobody loves the gas meter that they use. Oh, we do. We, okay. we no, I'm serious. We we really do now. Okay, well and, that's good. And Ho hopefully they're the ones that we're looking at getting for the grant. <laughs> and and, and it, it was funny you should say that because what for for where we use them is down in inside vaults and yep. in confined, confined spaces. spaces. Yep. And I talked to a, a a friend of mine that works in Con Ed, New York, mm -hmm. New York City. Yep. I said, what do you use? And because they do all this, like you said, they do all this research. And he says, we use these and this is why. And then I gave it to our EHS person, and that person, Sandra, she just, I mean, she was just on it. And her with Gary, uh, another guy, Gary, an EHS guy, and we have had nothing but tremendous success with them. Because now they're, they're truly portable. They're, they're before you have to, but now the guys wear them all the time. The guys never take them off now. Yeah. So. And we're, we're moving to at least a, a group of people that will have the carbon monoxide monitors on them. It's not going to have the hydrogen cyanide and the others, but it will have at least CO. So that's one less thing that we'll have to worry about with the... Uh, so you have your department officers have them? We're going to have, I don't know if it will strictly be officers, how we'll, how we'll break it up. We're, we don't have them yet. They're coming through the grant. Okay. But it will likely be based on uh, seat position in the trucks. They'll be on the packs. Mm. Yeah. And so they're accessible. Standard, yeah, standard yeah. operating procedure. You put a pack on if you're going into the building. So it may not be the officers that end up with them, but at least people that are going into the building will have them. It will be one less thing to grab from the truck and hold on to and, and worry about. Don't, 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 uh, skimp on those, Stevie. No, we're not. Okay. We're not. And some of the other things that, um, that we're looking at, we've got to get some new log land um, gear, helmets, and a few new sets of uh, uh, forest firefighting gear, and a few pairs of boots. And just, you know, we're, we're at a point now, hopefully, where instead of looking at that really big six-figure digit, Every several years, we're, we're spending a little bit every year, and we're, we're chipping away at that. It's much more manageable, but you can't do that overnight. You work, out to work your way up there. You do. Yeah. And um, then lastly, on the town park, I've asked for another hundred dollars next year to bring that budget ask up to an even thousand, and. That budget was 1500 at one time. It was, uh, it was clipped back. And one of the things that we've noticed there, we're going to do a little bit of tree removal. We're going to replace a few trees as well. Um, there's a lot of in-kind labor that goes on up there as well. Uh, but just in looking at some of the expenses that we have pending and looking at the overall trajectory of where that budget was going, I'd like to at least get it a little more stabilized. And um, the SBFA does enjoy proceeds from that, but the, the proceeds are in the mix of the other fundraising that we do. So we need to make sure that we've, you know, we're not putting everything back into the town park um, every single year. And we can, uh, we can have a little bit to fund different things that the SBFA will do, scholarships and what have you. Okay, anything else? No, that's the, that's a listing. I'd be happy to entertain any other questions or um, any other conversation on, on the overall idea. You're not ready for a new truck yet? <laughs> no, 
You're just going to ask how the other one's doing. <laughs> yeah, no, you have to ask. <laughs> That's the only time he's going to say no, so you're going to ask now. You've been out car to drive for a couple more years. Yeah. Um, but it, it is something, you know, in another five years. See? It's probably going to be time to start, to start, start shopping. At it. An electric one. Yeah, maybe by then, you <laughs> if, know. If they can make one that will hold all the batteries and all the water, yep. then I'm all for it. But anything to get away from the emission stuff with diesel engines nowadays. Yeah. That'd be great. Do you have to put that blue stuff in your truck too? Oh yes. Yeah, uh, the the urea stuff. Yeah, the cow urine. Oh, yeah. 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 Yes. <laughs> yeah. It gets very. The truck gets very upset when it runs low. Yeah. Very yeah. The worst thing you could. I, I was always. I, I wondered about that because if you idle a diesel now for an extended period of time, it it really does a number on them, doesn't it? Well, it's not so much the idling. What at least with with that truck, what we found is, if it's if it's on a scene, we haven't had it going to regeneration while it's been on a scene pumping water. Um, however, we do well, you have, have you got the RPM stuff to that's pump. Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and and it doesn't when you really look at it, the truck may idle for 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Uh, we never do shut it off at a scene, but. It's, it's rare that the truck is sitting somewhere and it's not moving water you know, for three or four hours. It just doesn't, doesn't right. do that. And um, we do have instances where the truck will be out and it will say regen needed. So then we have somebody drive it down 116 to Applebee's, make the U-turn and come back. And that's typically enough uh, for, the, for the elements to burn themselves off. Yeah, either that or a quick trip up 91 to Greenfield and back home. Huh? <laughs> we've done both, and yeah. we found that going that way is, it does it. It's enough time. The speed is high enough. The RPMs are high enough, and uh, and it's closer. You know, we're closer to our coverage area. And, 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 and I say that, it's kind of interesting to point out that, believe it or not, if, if someone sees Sunderland Fire Truck at Applebee's, Right, there's a reason why it's out where it but is. But there, there, there is a reason. Yeah, no, there is and, a and just, and, and, and that's why. It, it's part, we don't have enough straight, flat highway to, to oh. run the vehicles. And they have to, with the new emission controls on the, on the vehicles, that you need to do that. Yeah, 15 miles sustained. Yeah. Or, or more or less sustained. Yeah. Is what, is what it wants. Um, we've also... Um, to that point, I'm glad you brought that up. We're also putting a lot of emphasis on driver training for the people that would be operating the trucks. And residents may see the trucks out evenings, weekends, with only two people in it. They don't seem to be in much of a hurry. Well, that's what they're doing. They're doing training. They're yep. getting people familiar with, uh, with the trucks. And we've got a, um, a pretty substantial uh, operating procedure. For that sort of training, and, and it did. It, and, it, and Steve, I, you know, pe people if people know why, mm -hmm. they, there's not as many questions. But sometimes people have, well, why? Why are they're just riding around again? Mm -hmm. right. And <laughs> and it's not not necessary. That's not necessarily why. There is training, mm -hmm. and driving a fire truck with what you get. 2,000 gallons, 1,500 gallons of water inside of there. 1,500 gallons of water, man. That, that's yeah, eight, a little differently eight, than eight your car. Three pounds per gallon, so that's yeah. 10,000 pounds, 10,000, well, 10,000 pounds of water sloshing around if you don't have a lot of baffles inside there. It's yeah. yeah. it different. It's, it's di and spatially, as far as how much space it takes up on the road, yeah. it's, it's very different and something as simple. Our, all of our big trucks now, our cab forward designs. Uh, the yeah. engine is behind the driver, essentially under your, your, your right arm. And it takes a little while to get used to driving those versus having the hood out in front of you and you can sort of see where you are in relation to the yellow line and mailboxes and what have you. So it requires a little bit of, you know, probably 40 or 50 miles of road time before yeah. you can have a real good feel for it. Yeah. And then, 
we're fortunate in some respects because we don't have a lot of fire calls. People don't have a lot of experience driving the trucks. I, I'm willing to, to take that compromise um, because it's better for everybody, but yeah. we don't have a, uh, you know, a call volume where you get up. your, you your day to drive is Monday, your day to drive is Tuesday, your day to drive is Wednesday, and everybody gets a fairly consistent experience. Yeah. We've got to make sure that, that piece of people are... Um, all right, Chief, what do you have for uh, capital? Well, I'll start with the um, generator connection. And this is to support the final commissioning of the new generator that will supply the public safety complex. And uh, Highway Superintendent was kind enough to find this one and go through the, the process to acquire it and it's in place. We're still waiting for the propane tank to be delivered, and we still have to have the wiring installed. And this is essentially to complete the last 50 feet of wiring from where the uh, device will sit. It's behind the highway department. Uh, it's going to go through some conduit that's already in place and connect into the public safety complex in the same place where the current generator connects. Hmm. Current generator is in the building. Uh, very excited to have the new one up and running because it'll free up our space in the building. Right. Yeah, it will eliminate some challenges that we have filling the air bottles with the current generator being in the building. And the current generator is really old, so we're better off getting that onto its next home, wherever that may be, as soon as possible. And the estimates that we've seen for this is just a click over $5,000 that uh, George was able to get from the electrician that had done the majority of the work so far. Obviously, it's something that will have to be bid, but we're confident that that figure is going to be, uh, you know, even with what's going on today with pricing and, uh, and the trades. Yeah, it should be reasonable. Yeah, it will be, it'll be good. And, um, what are you going to do with the old uh, generator, Steve? As soon as we don't need it, we will surplus it. And I don't know how much we're going to be able to get for it, just because of its age, but it's it's a hefty generator, and somebody might be able to make great use of it in a uh, sawmill or <coughs> a, uh, industrial application. Okay. And it's the, the um, that generator is likely gonna always are a little ambitious with these sorts of things, but 15, 20 years life for that generator with um, with its current state of electronics and everything else. Electronics aren't always a great thing, I dare say, but it's very simple and we're going to expect a lot of life out of it when it gets done. So this is that last piece to get us up and running on a nice new reliable generator. The okay, next. The next thing, and this, this one and the public safety complex, HVAC, are sort of in the king, same category. Jeff and I were talking about them, and the thought was these might be candidates for ARPA funds. Um, these are both subjects that I've brought up in the past at uh, varying times and in varying forms. The first one is the exhaust removal system. I spoke with the vendor that had given us the most appealing bid the last time I put it out, uh, or the most appealing price. We had a problem with combines, and we were advised to pull the bid solicitation. And then just in the fiscal year um, setting, we didn't rebid it. But um, that contractor recommended that I think about $100,000, it's about $20,000 higher than three years ago when we looked at installing this system previously. And um, it was a little bit of a standoff. I said, well, can you get me a quote? He said, well, do you have the money? I said, can you get me a quote? He said, do you have the money? So if I can tell him, and which I now can, that the capital request has been made and nobody knows what will ultimately happen, but um, it's, it, I'm, I'm that much further down the road. And 
for those that aren't 100% familiar with what we're talking about here, I probably should have started with this. This is a system where each truck or vehicle in the fire station, when you start it, it produces exhaust. And if you were to build a fire station now, a brand new fire station, you've got to have one of these systems in place, which is essentially a big exhaust fan connected to ductwork and flexible, flexible hoses that connect to the exhaust pipe on each vehicle with a magnet. And they run on a little track, and when the vehicle gets to the doorway, the, there's a little switch that causes the magnet to deactivate. So you essentially get very little in terms of exhaust fumes in the building. And when the vehicle comes back in, you back it up, somebody on the ground clicks the magnet onto the exhaust pipe, and then you proceed back into the building. And they're not really complicated, but I've learned over the years that um, there are a few different types of these systems, some that are engineered and some that are manufactured by one party, the motors, the hoses, the sensors, the electronics, and there's various types of experiences with all the different sorts, but I will be requesting an updated quote from one of the manufacturers that combined provides the whole system, and clearly it'll have to be bid, but uh, those Jeff and I will work out those bid documents to reflect what we're truly looking for. And, um, I would say that even if we did have funding immediately, clearly there's a process we've got to go through, but if we were looking to write a check today, we'd still be looking at two to six months before somebody could come and actually do it. Because of backlog, yeah. you know, this widget or that widget is on back order. Um, people don't have time, so um, that's another thing to think about. Um, probably going to have to put some, uh, be a little more open-minded in terms of time for completion when we finally do bid this eventually. Um, currently, the building's got an exhaust fan up in the peak that we use, and if you run it for about 10 minutes, it'll clear most of the exhaust out. But up in for that 10 minutes, everybody's breathing the exhaust. And the fan also exhausts all the heat. That they I just was just gonna say, yeah, truck lose all of that. Out. Yeah, so summertime, this is good to have any time, but in the winter time, you really appreciate not dumping all your heat. Yeah. Any questions on the exhaust system? I'll start seeing them. Okay. Now last but not least, the public safety complex HVAC upgrades. Right. And this old unit doesn't seem to <laughs> doesn't seem to go away from it doesn't, doesn't. for very long. Um, what we had for the past twelve months was a situation last winter where we could not control the heat in the building. And there were some days you'd go into the building, it was eighty-six degrees and could not do anything. Um, then this summer, when the seasons changed, uh, very same thing. The air conditioning would not click on. And as near as we could tell, it was an issue with, the, with how the system was reading the set points, hmm. at which it was determining when to heat and when to cool. And if, even then, in June, it thought that it was 60 degrees outside, and we needed some heat in the building. Well, it was 80, you know, 80, 90 degrees outside, but it was still trying to heat the building. Um, we were able to get a contractor from Turner's Falls in that once they understood that we were no longer yoked to the, um, uh, the ESCO, energy service contractor, that had worked with us previously, they were willing to come in and get into the computer and change some of those settings for us. The challenge that we found is they, while fundamentally they understand how the system works, with all the additions and modifications that have been made to the system in the past 12 years, they can't really figure out exactly what each part is supposed to do in the whole scheme of things. Mm -hmm. So um, what the, the base proposal is, is to take the controls 
from the proprietary system that are in place and change everything over to a more uh, widely available uh, open type of a system where um, any contractor with people that are good at HVAC programming could come in, identify what things are doing and, and uh, be able to, to manipulate them. I am asking them to take it one step further and see about removing some of the electronics that are in the system. Um, because with everybody that I've spoken to, nobody can identify why all the parts and pieces were put into place. Mm. And it might be, it's, it's general consensus is it's significant past the point of diminishing return with all of the technology that was put into the building versus what our needs are. So, um, the, the, the perfect ask would be to take the entire HVAC system out, the boiler, <laughs> all the controls. Start from scratch. Start from scratch yeah. and just have programmable thermostats in a couple of rooms and be done with it. But that's probably not a realistic project for that building. Uh, we're also going to do some envelope work to it, primarily in ceilings. Is it all forced hot air or is it hydronic? It's, well, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, yeah, <laughs> like it's, a hybrid. It's, it's, it's a hydronic boiler, yep. but it's primarily forced hot air. In the, in the main part of the building, you've got hot air that blows over coils, either heating coils or cooling yep. coils. And in the truck bay and in the police sally port, um, you've got heaters that will it's a heating element and a fan behind it yeah, that, okay. that will blow and uh, produce the exchangers right, essentially yeah. what you need for heat. Okay. Um, the boiler itself is in good shape. We yeah. had the um, joints between sections rebuilt a couple of years ago. It was time. You know, the boiler was 13, 15 years old. It runs constantly. Yeah. And um, we've at the uh, for the cost of parts We've got a few people in the fire department that are qualified. They tore down some of the larger circulation pumps, resealed them, repacked them, replaced yeah. them. They've been working fine so far. Does that generate the domestic hot water too? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Heat on hot water. Yep. And I, I figure that last year with the uh, the heating snafu, we probably spent another thousand to fifteen hundred dollars on heating oil. That short period of time. Yeah. So this this isn't a this isn't a simple a simple answer. And it'd be nice to have it fixed though. Well, for a lot of reasons. Well, <laughs> you know? Ultimately, because you've got there there are some people that work in the building full time. Yeah. Um, and when they're calling, you know, and giving you choice words because the plants <laughs> have died. And yep. You can't, no, they can't. I'm sitting here in shorts trying to work because I'm That's sweating exactly to right. death. Yep. You know, can't bring my dog to work because you know, the MSPCA will call it abuse. Yep. You can't, um, you know, we, we just have to find a way to figure that out. And this work that was proposed is a great first step. Um, it may be feasible to eliminate some things, bring the cost down slightly. So I'd like to consider what I proposed as sort of the high water mark for the, the request. And then as I talk with these people a little bit more, maybe we can, we can shave that somewhat. And then maybe I, would, I would wager that this will require some more conversations down the line. But, be nice to have this finally fixed and not have to talk about it again, you know? I would love to. Yeah. I would love to. And then do some do some insulation work in the ceiling, which yep. is how we're losing most of our heat. Through there, yeah. And uh, we'll be in much better shape. So. Well, they're just fiberglass up there now, probably, right? Or is it? There's fiberglass. Problem is, the fiberglass is, is it's in bats. And the fiberglass and the vapor retarder have been moved so many times to do work, plumbing repairs. Um, 
electrical repairs and what have you, yeah. that you can't tell where somebody works. We had insulation blown in several years ago, and we found that the, the vapor barrier was not replaced. So you've got vapor drive yeah. into the building now. And um, it's, yeah, the, the, the four walls are pretty good. The floor is okay. The ceiling needs a lot of work yeah. from that regard. Okay. I'm not saying a word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I remember how that was built, and I was. Yeah. Somebody's father gave me a hard time about that. Yeah. That's all right. I want to know if the can't bring my dog to work is a serious comment. <laughs> and I really would like to know that. It it's it was implied. It was implied. Um, and you know, honestly. I, I, there were, um, the, the fire clerk, there was a few days, I told her, just work from home, because we couldn't, couldn't do anything. Um, it was, it was pretty unbearable in there. The police officers could go out on patrol. Chief Eric was, was sitting in his office in a t-shirt, I think, just <laughs> sweating away. We, we got that figured out, but there's no, there's no telling that it's not going to happen again. Yeah. Does that have an outdoor reset control on that system, or? It has to. It has I to. I think, yeah. But huh. there, there are so many. It was. And it's probably buried in. Uh, as I've seen some really horrible software systems too, where it's. It's. it's yeah. Well, the, the the software system that is it's in there now. Um, it was designed for. Case in point. Um, Somebody on the department works for a very large private university that just built a very nice uh, science building mm. with a lot of air exchange, yep. clean rooms, the whole nine yards. Their HVAC control system isn't as sophisticated as what we have on the fire station. Yeah. Over-engineered. It was, and it was done yeah. with the best of intentions. Yep. Uh, I'm not trying to get the um, trying to get the whole thing under control. But just one of those things. But yeah. all things considered, um, we've, we've squeaked through so far, I'd just like to stop squeaking yeah. and get it figured out. <laughs> yeah. Okay, anything else, Chief? Nothing on this. All I will say is uh, we're past the 15th of January, so you can burn brush again. Ah, there you to, go. Until we get to May. So we still call online? Online, please. Well, yeah, I get the permit online. Online, please. Um, the Shelburne Dispatch is no longer accepting um, permit requests by phone. Yeah. And there was an interesting conversation we had at the Chiefs meeting. I didn't know this, but the uh, Shelburne Dispatch has the highest percentage of business calls per dispatch center in the state. Hmm. And by business, not 911, but more often um, people needing help with alarm systems or what have you. No, no less important necessarily than some of the emergency calls. Um, That's different. Not all emergency calls, but some. But just based on the amount of staffing they have and the amount of emergency calls they get, they are, uh, Charles Garrity, who runs the, the dispatch center, really has his hands full trying to get extra staff based yeah. on the metrics that they use. Yeah. So he said, we, we just can't handle it. They, they, on the, one of the first few nice weekends in the spring, they could get upwards of 200 to 300 calls in the county for people wanting burn permits. We're, we're rural people, that's what we do. Absolutely. We, we get a brush pile, we, we get a pound of hot dogs from Millstone, we go down and, yeah. and burn them. Put your chairs piles. out. I mean, come on, Steve. Well, honestly, it's and fast. And we want to talk to people, not online. do it on a computer. Not, yeah, and, and it's very easy on a computer. It is. It's like. But you can't do it in Sunday, you can't do it on Sunday, so. That's correct. Right. We are not burning, not burning on purpose in Sunderland on Sundays. <laughs> not burning, Jeff. Not burning on purpose on Sundays in Sunderland. Right, but it's so far 
the, the vast majority of people in town have adopted the online. Yeah, um, it's simple. And, and, it's if, quick. and if somebody cannot do it the same way that I handle agricultural burn permits, I'll handle it with this. They just have to call me a couple days beforehand, uh, call up the station. Some people have other ways of getting a hold of me, and um, we can arrange it. The problem is we don't know until the day of if With the DP wind is going to allow burning. So I've got yeah. my list, and I, I work through that way. But, uh, just take a look at the weather a few days ahead if you're planning on burning, yeah, just to keep an eye on that. It's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's very simple. Just yeah. you go online, Google, Google, Google search. Uh, it takes like five burning permits, five Franklin County. FCBurnPermits.com. Yeah. And that actually, and and there's a link. I mean, your site, I think, is there. Oh, yeah. There is. So you can always that, do that too. That site was developed. One of the deputy chiefs in Shelburne, his son created that as part of a. Uh, I can't recall. If, I don't think it was a master's program project. But it was a college project, and it's great. Nice. It's great. It's it's works seamlessly. And the nice thing is, you can pull up a map of where the fires are. It's got everybody's information. Oh, good. Uh, even if we're going mutual aid to another town, it shows us where somebody's fire got out of hand. It shows us where it was. So. It's a so nice, it's a perfect per perfect. Yeah, it works well. But all in all, um, we're we've got a great group of firefighters. And they're very grateful for all the support that we get because we are, um, you know, we feel it. People thank us, they're sincere, yep. and uh, proud of what we do. Thank you, Stevie. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. All Thanks. right. Have a good night. Right. You too. Finance committee, you all set? I do believe. Fingers crossed, we don't have drought conditions again this spring, too, you know? Hopefully we get more rain. It's looking pretty slim. Did you, want, did you want to adjourn your meeting? Or you? Well, so did Robert's Water Rules of spot. Order yeah. um, tell us how to handle well, that's good. when someone drops off a Zoom call and we no longer have quorum? Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Do we yeah. have to adjourn? Technically, we lost quorum at 7.15 yeah. when one of our members dropped off. Our fingers crossed, you know. Okay. So. All right. Because uh, well, I'm going to keep going. We yeah. have to do hey, that. Right. There's your trade-off. I know. Good. Okay, um, if that's okay with you. Okay, yeah. hey, you too. Um, yeah, that sounds good. Do I need to officially adjourn? Or I don't have quorum, so it automatically yeah. did it. Yeah. It automatically did it. Yeah. So you're all um, set. <coughs> Linda, we lost quorum when Joe dropped off the call, so our meeting is technically adjourned. All right. We'll take that as a. <laughs> So right. select board minutes of the right, thanks, uh, is thanks. Thank you we'll for see you coming. Next week. January tenth minutes. Tonight. Motion. Uh, motion on those. Second. And motion made and seconded to accept as presented the minutes of January tenth. All those in favor, <coughs> please signify by saying aye. 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 Three zero, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, Housing plan vote, yeah. Housing plan vote, we, you didn't want us to vote tonight, did you? If you're ready to, the planning board voted last week uh, to approve it. Yeah, I, I'll hold it for next week, okay? Yep. All right. Uh, host, uh, host community agreement, Jeff? Yeah, the, do you want me to yeah. give the background? Okay, yeah. so... Um, and I'm trying to think when when you all were here was it November maybe even before that um, Gracious Greens came to introduce themselves to the select board um, the select board appointed uh, the chair or asked the chair to negotiate with with me on behalf of the town uh, with Gracious Greens you know from my perspective we had we had productive conversations um, ultimately came to a consensus on, on a host community agreement. Um, some of the highlights are a 3% community impact fee, um, a five-year term. There's also a, um, a charitable contribution that, um, that would be deducted from the community impact fee amount. 
um, sort of make sure that, that community nonprofits or charitable organizations uh, have some benefit as well. Um, and I think those are the highlights. You know, it, it went very well. It wasn't contentious. It wasn't hard fought. I thought it was a good conversations that we that we had. And um, so I think the the next step um, is if the select board has any questions or, or if you're ready to approve it, I think you would uh, take a vote to approve the host community agreement. And then I would send it um, to Gracious Greens, who would sign copies, send it back the originals, and then um, we would have you guys sign it, and then I would send them back um, a fully executed copy so that they could move forward with the process. So, so Dave and Crystal, if, if you look under the uh, annual charitable nonprofit contributions, it says the company shall annually contribute up to $5,000 to public charities or nonprofit organizations that provide benefits to town residents. So specifically, what we were what what we were trying to do was find a organization that would help with uh, recovering people with drug dependencies or programs that help yep. programs with drug dependencies. That and so that we we kind of wanted that that was. It's not as easy as one may think to find a program that those chair that, right? Okay, but that that would be one of our one of the things that we would would want to look to. So that's why that was there, in case you're wondering. Mm -hmm. So when you're saying drug drugs only or drugs and alcohol or are you? Yeah, right. And I, I consider drugs uh, alcohol a drug. Okay. okay. And. And that and, and 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 again that that was kind of the thought process of why that why that was there is that you know I mean you could say playgrounds or, or whatever yeah but we I yeah, kind of thought it was important that it's usually an element tied to that with these yep. yeah and, and 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 we're not I'm not saying that anything is contributing but from our experience and our position, programs that help people are very important. Yep. Yeah. So that's why we tried to include it. And Gracious Green was very acknowledged that straight up, and they didn't have a problem with that at all. Um, actually, I don't really think we had any other concerns, did we, Jeff, in here? No. No. Nope. That we we had, I think the one thing that we changed was if something that happened in Boston on an agreement doesn't necessarily reflect our agreement here in Massachusetts or Sunderland. So we we, we addressed we kind of addressed that. That was something that Gracious Greens had had brought up. Yeah. Um, so we didn't really think that. We also s said that after a period of time, we would re come back and look at it, at the agreement once again. Gracious Green, is that your take also? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Pete D'Agostino for Gracious Green. Yeah, uh, we thought it was a great process. Uh, as the board may remember from my introduction when we first met a few months ago, uh, you know, we've represented clients in a lot of municipalities. This was. Uh, Certainly, one of the best experiences we've had. Uh, I think it was very much just making sure you know we all understood what it was. Uh, it's great, a great experience. Uh, I think it went back and forth very quickly uh, without a lot of um, objection from anybody. I think we were just trying to make sure we all had it right. So we certainly appreciate the process, um, and if the board so inclined, we we'll certainly look forward to moving forward uh, with the special permit process, which everybody knows will still. You know, continue to engage the community through public hearings and so on and so forth. Um, we started to reach out to engineers and architects to start looking at, uh, you know, how we would address uh, traffic and pedestrian access and some other things in that area. So, those are all things we're excited to get going on. Um, and I just would remind the board uh, if 
in fact, the board chose to move this forward tonight, um, potentially a motion to consider authorizing the chair to sign the CCC attestation form, which is the document that we would actually need to submit to the state. We don't we don't submit the HCA under the current process by the state. That's an agreement between the entity and the town. Uh, but we do sign, uh, it's maybe a one or two page document, I don't have it in front of me, uh, that each party signs saying that we've entered into an agreement, uh, the details of which aren't included this, as part of the submittal at this time. So I, I just offer that for the board's consideration as, as they deliberate on, on this. And we couldn't be more excited. We really enjoyed the process so far, and we're ready to uh, move forward to the extent the town's ready to let us. So we look forward to that. So, so uh, Crystal and Dave, you you notice that we have we there is a section on the traffic study. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not required in the host agreement. It it was something that we added um, due to the it, location. We 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 wanted we wanted to make sure that and it's again it's going to probably go to the planning board, zoning board, whatever, and they're they're going to or maybe even the state's going to require it for access on but we just wanted to convey to gracious greens that uh, our serious concern about traffic and the safety of pedestrians and vehicles etc on that area yeah. and again it's really saying that they they're going to do that if required which will, will be required but again we just wanted it as a point of emphasis to bring this up again and it really doesn't add or detract from the agreement, but it's something that we wanted to portray. We wanted to just reinforce that it is a very serious concern of ours. And they did not have a problem with that. So I, I, uh, that was great. Any other questions on the, on the host agreement? Jeffrey, anything? No, I did, Peter, I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it, that that attestation is too, two points if i recall and it hasn't changed which is one that we think it complies with zoning and two that we've signed a host community agreement and i think it's literally like three sentences um but i you know so if the board wants to make a conditional vote if my assumptions are true then you're okay with it um or I can actually print it out and have it ready for the next meeting so that you can, if that's not right, um, you can do that then. Yeah, Jeff, Jeff, if I could, so the, there's there's three documents that get submitted to the CCC as it relates to the town. The, the first document is an attestation from us that we conducted a community outreach, outreach meeting um, that's signed by the principals of the company, but not by the town. The, the second document that the CCC receives is an attestation that we uh, have entered into a host community agreement. That's signed by each party, and you're right, Jeff, it's three or four sentences. It basically says you acknowledge you've entered into an agreement meet everybody's side. The, the third one, which is the um, what the CCC calls the municipal response, which is the zoning form, uh, that document is uh, once our application is deemed complete by the CCC that document is then sent to the town typically the town administrator it could be sent to a uh, planning board uh, but that document is sent from the CCC directly to the town uh, anybody in the town so it wouldn't necessarily have to come back before the board depending on how you guys structure things like that but uh, anybody from the town that's authorized can then sign it and then they send it back to the CCC so is interesting the first document is only signed by us the second document is signed by both parties and the third document the, what the ccc calls the municipal response is only signed by the town and not by us and that's just confirmation that we are in the proper zone uh, that does come later in the process and, and the town uh, should the board allow us to move forward the town would receive that request directly from the ccc so that's that's the process as it relates to the uh documents between the parties, the state, and the town. And I'm happy to answer any questions on that. Thanks, Pete. All right, what do you recommend to Jeff? Um, I recommend a, a motion to approve the host community agreement and authorize the select board chair to sign the attestation. So moved. 
Okay, we have a motion made and seconded to uh, move the host agreement with a provision for the chair to sign when documentation is presented. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Three zero, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you uh, to the board so much. We really appreciate your, your trust in us, and we're really excited to get started. Look forward to working with you and the town and the rest of the board. Thank you so much. Good luck, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Good luck. you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Um, updates? Suck board update, David? I have no other meetings this week, unusually. So. <laughs> Congratulations. It's, yeah, it's a short, quiet Crystal? week. But. I got nothing. Um, just, I guess, I don't know if this is an update or just just a, uh, a comment. University of Mass is starting school. Students will be coming back the 23rd, 24th, 25th of January. I can, I can almost guarantee that COVID rates will go up. It's already, yep. it's, it's already predicted that they'll go up. I, I, I just want everybody, you know, to, to, to understand that. And from what I'm seeing is that how we um, look at it, we may be, they, they may be changing how it's reported, you know. I don't know. It's all a moving target, you know, because it's it's, it's a moving it's a moving target. What I can tell you is that the, if you resident of Sunderland, um, the university is offering testing, community testing. Okay. You can go to the university, and and if you if you want to get tested, um, there you can go on their site, look under the COVID nineteen uh, regulations they have. Go to umass.edu. Look up their COVID thing. It'll tell you how to get your a test kit and how you can. Uh, uh, the, it's a it's a non witnessed sample, and and as long as you're um, asymptomatic, and you can use a test, put it in one of their kiosks, which one of them located right in front of the the Mullen Center. You drop it off, and 24 to 48 hours later, you can have a uh, the result. Right. Yep. So if if you want, you can take advantage of that. Um, I guess now the federal government's paying for COVID tests, sort of. Yeah. So I was going to mention that um, I think each household is entitled to four free tests that they will mail to you. Um, we'll post the link to our website. Okay. Um, and I think registration opens tomorrow, so you can't actually register. But the other thing I wanted to mention is that um, insurance will cover home rapid tests as well. So um, you can, uh, depending, I don't know all, all the insurance carriers' rules, but if you're purchasing home test kits at you know a, a pharmacy or something, keep the receipt. You should be able to resubmit it um, or submit it to, to insurance and be reimbursed. Um, and, and again, I just I just mention it um, because you I'm I'm sure it'll be written in the news. Um, um, I, and this people in the science behind it say uh, your best bet is the uh, the vaccinations, current vaccinations with a booster, um, and wear a mask when you're. Yep close proximity and uh, we shall see anything else Jeff any updates from town administrator side um, I just I, I, I think um, from personal experience driving down South Main and seeing a Christmas tree blowing down the road um, in high wind activities if you have any you know empty trash cans or things like that they're, they're gonna get blown over so um, maybe think about bringing them in I know today was crazy and not as expected as over the weekend yeah. but um, just a, a public service announcement and then the other thing is to remind people that um, Community Preservation Act uh, applications for grants are gonna be due a week from 
Friday. Yeah, that's the 28th, a week from Friday. Um, so if there's anybody out there with projects in open space, historic preservation, recreation. We're going to have an opening on that too soon, right? What's that? We have an opening on that? I think. Uh, yes. So in case that's right. Uh, in if that? somebody wants to join the committee, um, open space, housing, recreation. There's a fourth, isn't there, Tom? Space, housing, recreation. Oh, historic preservation. Historic oh, preservation. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah, the south side of town, you have to batten things down when it gets windy, because <laughs> it gets very windy out in the flats. Alrighty. Final act. I motion we adjourn. Second. We have a motion duly made and seconded to adjourn. Any discussion? Hearing no discussion, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Jeff, declare us out at uh, six, uh, 8.30.